I'm John Wilson, I'm the CEO at Agenta. We're a technology company that focuses on education and learning. We build, manage and operate platforms for education, for video collaboration. Externally we prefer to work with what we feel as ethical industries, um, obviously education, teaching, learning, healthcare. We feel that we can really contribute to these industries by creating exciting platforms, um, easy to use platforms, secure platforms that people can utilise. What we feel is one of the most important things for Scotland to boost economic growth uh, is investing in rural areas. By investing in uh, broadband in these local areas we can attract more talent, we can attract more companies and we can drastically improve the delivery of education and learning within these schools within disparate regions within Scotland.
ready to get started and get underway with day two of Alps Annual Conference 2018. And coming up on stage right now, and who we're going to give a very warm welcome to in a minute, are our co-chairs for the day. So, as we said to you yesterday, our board of trustees has taken a very active lead in running this event. So, we have a bit of a change in personnel each day, at least for some of us, and we're welcoming a new co-chair for the day this morning. So, if you could all please put your hands together and give a very warm welcome to Sheila McNeil, whom you know from yesterday, and also James Clay. Okay, well, good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to everyone that was here yesterday. And I know we have a few more delegates in the room who have just joined us today, so it's fantastic to have you all. We had a great start to the conference yesterday, and I think everyone who was here would agree that there was a really fantastic atmosphere, a huge amount of collaboration and, and sharing, and a lot of thinking about the context of where we were, where we were all working. And we a great keynote yesterday, and we're gonna have another great keynote speaker this morning. Um, but just want to cover a couple of things that we're doing later today. But before we do that, I'm going to hand over to James to do a little, a little bit more of an introduction. Hello, Manchester. Right. <laughs> <laughs> who, who, okay, it's day two. So who here is just here for day two? If you could just stand up, show yourselves. Go on, stand up, get up, wave. So welcome. Now, stay standing if this is your first alt. So there's a few people. So everyone who's been here for a long time or many years, go and say hello to these people at some point. So <laughs> welcome to day two, another exciting, amazing day of ed tech. I'm not going to go for everything, I think, because you've all got the menus. But what I would like you to do is, well, I, I had some, saw some amazing stuff yesterday. What I want you to do is to turn to your neighbor, not the person you walked in with, and, and say what your highlight was of yesterday. So if you just talk to each other, what was your highlight of yesterday? What was the thing that stood out for you that you're going to take back? today as well. But just a couple of things we want to highlight that are happening today. Again, we've got an action-packed program. Um, but today, for the first time, we're going to have a celebration for all our CMALT um, award, award winners, um, people who have gained their CMALT accreditation this year. So just again, just because we don't want you to sit still for very long here, if you've recently um, got your CMALT, could you just stand up and say hello? And just, if you have your badge, well done, everybody. You, you can sit down, but we will um, obviously be celebrating um, your achievements later today as well um, at our AGM. So, pass over okay. to James. Manchester holds a special place in my heart because nine years ago, I was awarded the Learning Technologist of the Year Award in 2009, along with Viv Rolf. And um, tonight, we will find out who the Learning Technologist year of the Year is for 2018. So I'd like to make a big warm welcome to all the Learning Technologist of the Year finalists. Stand up, make yourselves known. There is none here, right? <laughs> but as you will know, it is not too late to vote for the Community Award. So please check out the website, find out how you can vote for the Learning Technologist of the Year Community Award. The awards we will find out tonight, both that winner and the other winners. So vote, vote, vote. Yeah, it's, it's great. And as also as a previous winner of the Learning Technologist of the Year, um, I'm really looking forward to the awards tonight. But yeah, please vote because the Community Choice Award is a really special award to win as well. Um, but we're now going to hand it over to Nick Whitten, who's going to uh, 
Give us an update from the games, from some of the games from yesterday. Well, I've never won learning technologies for the year, and I'm feeling a bit inadequate. <laughs> but thank you for listening anyway. <laughs> Um, so, discovered something about failure yesterday when we thought, put together what was what we thought was an incredibly difficult puzzle uh, on our playing cards, only for somebody to actually crack it before the end of the first keynote. So, <laughs> which meant desperate scrabbling around for the made-up prize. So, please join me with um, congratulating Julie Vez for uh, <laughs> epic puzzle solving. Um, I said, if you haven't solved it yet, there is a secret puzzle. Julie's worked out how to do it. Um, we'd be really interested in anyone who could tweet the answer to the puzzle. There might be other prizes. Thank you very much. Um, I think no. Um, no, we're just going to hand back to Marin. Um, again, um, we're really lucky that we have some fantastic sponsors uh, at the conference today, and we're going to be hearing from a couple of them as well. But I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, before we get to hear from more people, there are some activity for you. So yesterday, we all started being encouraged going to Wikipedia and get editing. But today, we have something else, which is to give you an opportunity to help us celebrate 25 years of ALT in real style. And as you can see, we've had a bit of a mailbag delivery this morning, as some of our um, participants and members from around the world have started making their own birthday cards and sending them to us. This has been a bit of a birthday present from Brian Mothers, who many of you will know. And I want to give a big shout out to Brian and his work for Visual Thinkery, who's really helped us as an organization communicate more about what we do. So we'll be tweeting out the link via the Alp account, and you can also find it on Brian's own Twitter. And we hope that you take this opportunity to remix your own card with your own picture and message for us to have a really full um, pin board of all of these. As usual with Brian's work, it's all openly licensed, so you can see, you can share and download these images and edit them yourself. So hopefully, you'll have a bit of fun with this today and help us send many messages. This will stay available throughout the conference, and I know that some of our delegates in far-flung places who are joining us remotely have started sending us mail as well. So a big wave to them too. Now, just as yesterday, we're here to help you make the conference the best experience that we can. But if you haven't met anybody yet, and I think in a moment we'll find out to see who's been doing well with all their networking, do come to the outstand and we'll try and introduce you to some colleagues. And also, we're here to help at the help desk in case you have any questions. So with that, I'm going to hand over to John now, who's going to get you to share a few highlights from your first day. Um, and give a warm welcome to John, please. Thank you. Right, good morning everyone. Uh, I'm just going to actually, for the benefit of those people who are here today as day one, I'm just going to quickly explain how you get connected with me too. Uh, I know a number of you participated yesterday, so thank you for that. But for those of you that are here uh, on your first day, um, in order for you to join in with the activity that we're about to do here, um, I need you to uh, go to a browser on your device, be that a laptop, tablet, or phone, and if you could enter the web address web.meetoo.com. We'll just give you a couple of minutes to do that. That's web.meetoo.com. You'll find these instructions are also in front of you on the leaflet on, uh, on your desk there. So once you're on that browser, you're going to need to enter the meeting ID, which is as follows. It's 152. 788927. I'll read that one more time. It's 152788927. And just while you're doing that, I will just mention on the reverse of the card, I know a number of you have been participating in AOTC Bingo. Um, I'd encourage you to get involved in that today. It's a bit of fun. Um, so please uh, get involved with that if you can. Right. So as uh, Marin mentioned, uh, we're just going to touch on a couple of questions from day one. Um, and firstly, we're keen to ask you the following poll. How many people have you connected with at this year's conference? So 
Two or less, three to five, six to nine, ten or more. So how are you doing with that? We'll just give you a few seconds to make your selections. Okay, if we're done, I'll close it. One more, close it there. And let's have a little look. Very good. Very good. So we've got uh, nearly 30% of people who have met 10 or more people here for the first time. Uh, good spread of responses there. Very good. And you've already done your homework on this one. Um, you were asked the question, what was your highlight from day one? You've already communicated this with your neighbour. If you want to share it with the room. So in one or two words, what was your highlight from day one of the conference? If I could ask you to just respond now. Okay, just give you a few more seconds to finish off. Don't want to cut anyone off. Still a couple more coming in. Right, if everyone's done, I'm going to take it there. Okay. Right. So, keynote coming out loud and clear there, but lots of really good, interesting things here. I'm sure Marilyn will have some comments on this. We're going to share this. Um, we're going to tweet this out. So, thank you all for getting involved there. The final thing to say, uh, just to finish off, is in this room, throughout the day, we will have the Q&A available through Me Too. We encourage you to uh, use Me Too to ask your questions. They'll be displayed on the side screens. Enjoy day two of the conference. Thank you very much, John. And I think we should applaud us. It's great to um, have you here and hear that. Well, um, last yesterday someone asked about the word cloud and how you can get that, but we will um, tweet that out as well so you can see. And it's wonderful to hear so many highlights from yesterday. But moving on now, we are going to say. Thank you to all of our sponsors and exhibitors again who are supporting the event so strongly. And today we're going to hear from two of them as we did yesterday. And I'm really pleased actually to introduce to you our first speaker to give his welcome. Because Catalyst, the open source technologists, have been huge supporters and the headline sponsor of this year's event. And also, as we mentioned earlier, today is really a day that's supported by them as they've also supported the awards this year. And without their support, it wouldn't be possible for us to really give that recognition on a national scale to all the individuals, teams, and research projects we're going to be celebrating this evening. So please give a very warm welcome to Joey from Catalyst. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, good morning. Thank you, Marin, and thank you very much to the old team, uh, specifically, who've worked very hard with us um, in preparing to kind of sponsor and, and be involved in this event. We're very proud to be um, sponsored this event, and I'm going to share the reasons for that with you. Um, I'd also like to say a, a big congratulations to every, uh, every one of the finalists, which we'll be awarding uh, this evening, um, and we're very much looking forward to that. And, of course, to those who've just uh, been accredited CMOL this year. Well done. Catalyst are an, are an organization that partners with educators, uh, and we see ourselves as enablers of education. Um, we provide services around open source technologies. Uh, we build on the principles of open standards and open source, and that's at the heart of who we are as an organization. For example, we, we seek to retain no IP in any of the things that we deliver, in any of the solutions that we provide. And we unashamedly stand on the shoulders of others who've gone before us in open source. We use features, functionality, code, um, tools and technologies that they've built, and we enhance them, and we further them, and then we welcome others standing on our shoulders to continue that journey. Um, true open source, if you, if you will. Um, we, why did we choose ALT? Well, we were introduced to this event uh, last year by one of our customers, um, Bath University, and in particular somebody that many of you may know, uh, Kiriaki, who used to be at Bath but has since moved on. 
We attended last year's event as, a, as an exhibitor, um, and to be honest, we were bowled over by the, the community, the, the sharing and the collaboration that takes place, and, and the great work that all of you do. Uh, and then this year, in warming up uh, towards kind of our, our conference planning for the year, we recognized that the, the themes of this year's conference in particular um, were so closely aligned to, to some of Catalyst's values or mission statement. I should note, as, as techies, we, we have a Catalyst code rather than a Catalyst mission statement, but it's the same thing. So three particular themes in this year's event um, stood out for us. Participation, uh, collaboration, and openness. So three of the five key themes are basically um, directly aligned with what Catalyst has at its heart as, a, as its core ethos. Uh, for example, three key elements of Catalyst code are to champion the freedom to innovate, empowering people like yourselves to try new things um, and, and succeed through, through new innovations. Uh, we deliver solutions that create opportunities, and we are collaborative thinkers and doers with the use of technology. Three things that seem to align perfectly, not only with the, the kind of ALT group, but particularly this year's event. In short, you're all enablers, um, and we believe we're enablers too, enablers of you. <clears throat> so what do we do, um, and, and you know, how, what services do we provide, or, or how can we um, be of assistance to you? By a quick show of hands, uh, how many people in this room, in their institution, or in their daily lives use Moodle? A reasonable chunk. Probably a little smaller, how many use Mahara? Still a significant chunk, yep. One more that you may have seen on our stand this year, but it's probably slightly less in use. Uh, how about Totra, or Totara, if you put an English slant on that? Couple, one, two, okay. So what we offer to many of our partners and our clients is that we wrap services around those open source tools and technologies. Um, everything from hosting, support, maintenance, or if needed, custom development, enhancement, um, and, and furthering of those platforms so as you can deliver more to your end users, to your customers, and to your learners. Um, we develop new stuff. We guarantee your virtual learning environments under a service level agreement, and we share and collaborate with others under your permission. If any of those sound like things that you'd like to be involved with, please do come and talk to us at our stand. Thanks. Thank you very much, Joe. Well, I think um, maybe it was James Clay who said that our hashtag, Old C, is not just for September, um, it's all year round. And indeed, in recent years, we've started being very active, um, having lots of events throughout the year led by our members. And one of the highlights outside of the annual conference that we're enjoying this week is our winter conference, which, as I was updating our website recently, I realized it's now in its fifth year. I remember when this was kind of like the low-key sandbox event, and now it's like over 500 people joining globally. So no pressure then for whoever is helping us deliver that um, each year. And that's where Blackboard come in, because Blackboard are strong supporters of our annual conference and have been for many years, but they also provide the webinar platform that we use to deliver a lot of our webinars for our member groups, and in particular, the winter conference in recent years. So I think it's great for us to have member organizations support this conference, as we saw yesterday as well, throughout the year, and particularly around these three days here today. So please put your hands together for Gillian from Blackboard. Hello, uh, I'm Julian from Blackboard. <laughs> and I'm, I'm from Manchester. And I'm Hervé, uh, Julian's PA. Sorry. <laughs> and in the spirit of collaboration, I have brought my colleague, my um, colleague who is also a client success advocate, Hervé. Sorry, um, yes, my name is Hervé Didier Cook, so um, I'm not from Manchester, as you can <laughs> guess from my accent, uh, but like, more later. Indeed, um, yeah. So, um, yeah, welcome to my home city. Um, uh, I, I live just outside Manchester. I'm actually from a place called Ramsbottom, uh, but as a child, I got a real phobia about telling people about that. You'll understand why. <laughs> um, so, uh, Herve and I are part of the client success team. Do you just want to quickly explain? Yeah, what so they we, are? We, do, we do two things. Basically, uh, we work on the shop floor with, uh, with academics looking at uh, um, how uh, our solution can support their teaching and learning uh, objective. 
and at the same time we try also to engage in a strategic conversation with the senior leadership. You know, they have a teaching and learning strategy, or a digital strategy, they might want to go mobile. Oh, yeah, I can see the look on your face. You know, how do we go? How do we get, uh, do we get there? So that's what we do within client success. And basically, we have, uh, we have colleagues, by being a global company, what is pretty amazing is that we have uh, colleagues on, um, on the four or five continents with whom we can, uh, we can share uh, best practice, very much like what you do, you know, uh, within, uh, within Alt. Okay, yeah. So, uh, yeah, thank you for the plug, Baron, about Blackboard Collaborate, which will be uh, what you're using for the winter uh, conference. And it's good to be here again supporting Alt. Um, when we were asking the question yesterday about how many years, I can't remember, but I think it's my third one in Manchester. Uh, so it's been a long time. Blackboard proud to support Alt. Um, we're not quite as old as Alt. <laughs> Blackboard is 20 years old this year. Um, and, you know, we've been innovating education technology for that long. What you'll find with the Blackboard staff, many are from universities. I've only been with Blackboard for three years. I was at Salford University for a long time. And Herve, you've... Uh, I've yeah. been uh, living in the UK for almost 30 years. I haven't been kicked out yet. But I've got, <laughs> I've got my residence permit as a French citizen. So should Boris Johnson become Prime Minister, I should be all right. Should I? I don't know. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a tough one. Um, so one of the benefits of working for Blackboard, and I mentioned that about our backgrounds, because we've all been, we've been in, many of us have been in classrooms teaching the backgrounds, so we know what it's like to lecture, to work as learning technologists and so on. And Often what drives us is that um, belief that education technology is benefits students and can really bring together many students. So um, that is really our driving passion. And you know the fact that we work with so many countries across the world is unique. There's no other companies that do that in education technology. We're the world's biggest providers. And it's been, for me, been working at Blackboard, a great learning experience in sharing what my colleagues do in different markets, whether Australia or Mexico, because it's all very different markets. But there are things that we can learn from each other. Um, so, and, and to illustrate that, you know, in, in mature markets like the UK and the US, it's often about we, we're having very in-depth discussions about how do we improve the recruitment process. Yesterday we were talking about virtual using Collaborate for virtual open days to um, help students get access to universities, particularly those who maybe can't afford to come to university. It's a very ex expensive experience to, um, to go to visit universities for open days. Um, you know, in the mature markets, we look at uh, retention and results. Yet in Latin American emerging market, we're looking at massive on-scale learning for huge numbers. And we've got other countries, unfortunately, where it's war-torn um, and there's conflict. So it's, we've got to put solutions in place there that is working in that environment. And we learn from each other through that. <clears throat> so all that Im uh, experience impacts each other. It sort of ties back a bit to what Tressie was saying yesterday in her keynote presentation. So as I said, we all really believe in the power of EdTech to change education for all. Notice my colours today, <laughs> purple, white and green. <laughs> Um, you know, regardless of background, we're all very passionate about um, access to education for all learners, regardless of where they live, how much money they've got, what stage of life they're at, time a mature student, what disability they've I'm, got. I'm still very young. <laughs> yeah, well, well, not. <laughs> Um, so, and our mission is to work together with you. My favourite part of the job is where I work very closely with clients to help get bring those stories to bear and share those stories across the world um, to change things for students and academics and administrators in universities. Um, so just one yes. thing before we say that though, I think that um, one point I wanted to make is that Blackboard is often seen as just a VLE, but you know, you may be using Learn, the VLE, the Blackboard VLE in your institution, it may just be called Blackboard. But that's at the core of it. That's just one thing that we do. We've got a whole ecosystem. I'm not going to say that word that's on the buzz card. <laughs> uh, it's an egg tech platform that's much broader um, for future students <laughs> and, and lecturers. And open, source, and open source with Moodle Rooms. We do, as well. indeed. Yeah. Um, and 
we've got web conferencing tools which will um, uh, collaborate. We've got uh, Blackboard Ally, that's, that's, oh, it was a year old this year. <laughs> Nicholas, the product manager, stood here in April and announced its birthday. We've got uh, eTeacher, a recent product to help academics with their that's delivery. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well All right. Sorry. <laughs> so right, basically, so. basically to, to wrap it up, come and uh, visit us on our stand because we can show you very quickly what these solutions are about, but we can also talk, talk about uh, Brexit and pedagogy. So <laughs> please, 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 Don't get involved Brexit, I'll make. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's very nearly time for the moment we've all been waiting for. And if you're just coming to join us, please do come and find a seat. Now is the perfect time to do so, because I wanted to just make you aware of some late program changes. So please don't feel shy. Just come through. There's loads of seats everywhere. For Amber Thomas taking center stage, you're going to want to be comfortable to sit back and listen and enjoy. So please go and check the website. Um, for some late program changes for today. And while everyone is getting seated, and please don't be shy, do get seated where you're comfortable, I wanted to just invite you all here today to come to our AGM today, followed by a GASTA session. And many of you may not know what a GASTA is, but all will be revealed this afternoon when ILTA's very own Tom Farrelly from Ireland is going to host five amazing speaker sessions that are going to be hopefully the essence of what GASTA means. So hopefully that's tickled your curiosity a little bit. But also at the AGM, we're going to find out who's won this year's Honorary Life Membership and the Chairs Award will be announced as well. This is an inaugural award that Sheila is going to reveal this afternoon. So there's lots to look forward to and we're back here in plenary this afternoon and you're all very welcome. Please do come and join us. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Sheila to make a very special introduction. Thanks, Mary. Well, um, choosing a keynote um, is one of, as I found out over the past year, is one of the, the best parts of being a conference co-chair. I've never chaired a conference before, but that, that's been really exciting. And along with my fellow trustees, when we were discussing the, the conference keynotes, we had quite a hit list, if you like, of people that we wanted to invite. And I was absolutely delighted when this name was pretty high up on the, the list. But also, I was even more pleased when Amber said yes to the invitation to come and speak here today. Amber currently heads the academic technology team at the University of Warwick, and she leads her team in the rollout and implementation of many learning technologies. She's also, over the past year, taking a leader, leadership role in the Heads of eLearning Forum. So for those of you in the UK that are involved in the strategic direction and implementation of learning technologies, you'll realise how important that group is to all of us. Um, but before moving to Warwick, Amber's had quite a long and varied career that I think has touched on practically all sectors of the education system here in the UK through her work in BECTA, through her work with colleges, and more recently with her, her work at JISC when she was a programme manager. And I think it's fair to say that Amber was quite a pivotal figure in the UK OER programme. And I've been really fortunate in my working life that our cro paths have crossed on several occasions. And I think Amber is just one of those people I always really, really like getting the opportunity to speak to and to listen to what Amber has to say. Um, I like getting her advice. Um, and occasionally, like last year, I also get to hear her sing, which is quite a treat as well. Um, but more importantly, I think Amber's knowledge, her vision, her criticality, and her pragmatism make her an outstanding professional in learning technology. Um, she also has a great sense of humor, and she's just a great person to be around. I heart Amber. Uh, but I remember in the, learning days of, of learn in the early days of learning analytics, I think Amber came up with the, the phrases about Pimpact and Vanlytics when we were all slightly obsessed by our social media scores. How many of us remember Clout? 
and many of us still check our clout, uh, clout score. Um, but I know this morning, Amber's reflection on 20 years of uh, her experiences of 20 years in learning technology, I'm sure will resonate with me, with me and many of you in, in the audience. And for those of you who are a bit younger, um, listen to Amber, I'm sure what she's going to say will resonate with you too. So I would like you all to please join with me in welcoming our keynote for today, Amber Thomas. Sheila. I am honoured and terrified, genuinely terrified to speak to you today, um, my peer community. And I'd like to start by saying a big hello to everyone in the room and everyone watching online. As you'll see, I've got a lot to say and I've squished many thoughts into this talk. I'm going to start by telling you a bit about my journey to, to this point and then I've got some thoughts about innovation and change and how to be a good institutional learning technologist. And I'll end with some thoughts about our community more broadly. So first, a bit about me. I thought that I would map my history against Weller's 25-year timeline. And I confess I actually went a bit further than that. I marked myself out of, uh, zero to three on all of these. But that's for another blog post. I put it in a spreadsheet and did a star system and everything. Uh, but here we go. So um, I'm 42 years old, it's the magic number. And uh, 1993, I was nowhere near educational technology. I was uh, finishing my A-levels and discovering beer and boys. OK. Uh, and then I, my degree was in philosophy and literature. So like many of you, I didn't come uh, to this through computer sciences route. Uh, and in fact, I then, when I graduated, I realized I did not have a clue what I was going to do next. I was lucky enough that my first role, I had a really good uh, staff development boss, and she really developed me and encouraged me to go and uh, take all the courses and get involved with all the things and actually started off in university administration and went to uh, an administrator's conference where I first heard about lots of things, including the idea of process improvement and systems and corporate information systems. And for some reason, I thought that was really, really interesting. And then I had an opportunity to go and work for JISC, for the person that I had seen speaking at that conference, in fact, on information strategies. And that was a real privilege because I got to go around probably 25, 30 uh, institutions, mainly HE at that point, um, and learn about how those different organizations operated. Um, from there, I then went to Bechter, where I worked on the National Grid for Learning content portal, which was all about schools content development, and then to FURL which I recognize many faces from those days of working with um, FE. Um, brief stint at the University of Worcester on a JISC-funded project about sharing teaching and learning materials. And then considerable amount of time uh, at JISC, uh, when I, where I worked with many people on a, a whole range of projects. A um, very privileged position to work on a whole range of projects there and services. And then 2012, I came to the University of Warwick uh, where I'm now Head of Academic Technology and Digital Transformation. I did do a bit of life in the meantime, thinking of personal political history. I did get married and I had, somehow I had two babies during that time while I was working at JISC, uh, in between all the conferences. Um, I think that my first Alt-C was uh, 2001, which uh, very mem memorable, that was uh, in Edinburgh. And uh, it was, I was at Alt-C in Edinburgh when it was 9-11. Um, so Alt-C was sort of a bonding experience, I think, for those of us that were there. And since then, I've been to a number of Alt-Cs, and I'm not entirely sure which years I went to, hence the question marks. But my big contribution probably to Alt-C so far was 2011, uh, where we, we had uh, the first time there, we did a fancy dress session. So you can see there, Helen Beetham, David Kernhan, David White, and myself, and sorry to my colleagues for, for showing that picture. 
uh, fancy dress at Alt C. That's the first time for everything. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you from that bracket, one of the brackets that Tressie talked about in her keynote yesterday. I think I'm a learning technologist. I think I am. And thank you to, to Laurie for that book cover. We discussed, don't we, what it means to be a learning technologist. There's been a recent discussion on the alt members list about what it actually means to be a learning technologist. Um, we ask ourselves a lot of questions about what that means, and especially as institutional learning technologists. So hold that thought. Because I often don't feel like I am a proper learning technologist. I'm in an academic institution, but I'm not an academic. I'm a learning technologist who's not a teacher, researcher, or staff developer. And like many of my, my peers, I don't have a master's degree in ed tech. I'm a manager of people who do things that I can't do. I'm a woman in IT, and I'm an IT manager, an IT person who's not a programmer. So it all stacks up to quite a lot of imposter syndrome. And according to Kiriaki's research, I'm not alone. It's very common for heads of e-learning and senior learning technologists to have a touch of imposter syndrome. So looked at like this, I would place myself somewhere outside that. <laughs> I don't do and I'm not expert in any of those things. But then perhaps over the 20 years I've been working in educational technology, I have gained expertise and experience in a whole, whole number of uh, overlapping fields. And when I look at it that way, I'm kind of at the center of my own little Venn diagram there. And actually, on a day-to-day -day basis, many of the things that I do require me to travel between and across these areas, to listen and translate between them to recognize what kind of problem we're talking about at any one kind, and therefore what our options are for how to solve it. So maybe, maybe that imposter syndrome, that feeling of being on the edge, is a characteristic of needing to travel between those domains. And I wonder how many of you feel the same. And maybe this is OK. So I'm going to start with some thoughts about innovation. That's a bingo word, isn't it? Innovation, bingo. So for my entire career, I've heard predictions that we're on the edge of a revolution or on the brink of a landslide, and there's certainly been plenty of moral panics in the meantime. And as Martin Weller points out in The Digital Scholar, in our discourse, there's much talk about utopian or dystopian uh, visions of the future in educational technology. Now, at the moment, everyone's talking about disruptive innovation. And what I wanted to highlight is that people often assume that innovation will come from the outside that new technologies will be brought into education, there'll be new suppliers to the market, that change will come from private sector, new business models coming in. I wanted to bring your attention to this concept of the entrepreneurial state. And Mazzucati wrote about how often the state creates the conditions for innovation, how often the state funds the R&D and creates the market. I'm going to talk about future learn. So FutureLearn was launched late 2012, and the media covered it as a new entrant to the HE market, a disruptive innovation. Those of us who've been in the field quite a long time will remember another attempt to package UK HE courses for online consumption, the e-university. I think some people have got the scars to prove it. But back to 2012, here we go. Here's another go. Enter FutureLearn mainly six to 12 week courses entirely online, modeled obviously on, on existing MOOC uh, platforms such as Coursera and edX. Its products were free at the point of use. But here's the thing, they weren't free to create, they weren't free to produce. They were created by staff in existing institutions. Pat Lockley at Pigogi Consulting, here of the Penguins, sampled universities with a freedom of information request on what they'd spent on producing courses for FutureLearn. Now, uh, 19 institutions reported their spend, and that doesn't include the Open University, but of those 19 institutions, they reported three and a half million pounds spent on the courses that they produced for FutureLearn. 
My question is not whether they got return on investment. My point is that they spent a lot of money on FutureLearn. So how much have UK universities spent on making this happen? And that's even without talking about the Open University's role in this. In many ways, there's been a huge subsidy for FutureLearn. And probably that's the right thing to do. But what interests me is that somehow the media narrative was one of disruptive innovation. You'd read the articles in the newspapers and it made it sound as if this was entirely coming from the outside of our sector. That it was a new entrant to the market. It was these new people teaching stale old UK HE a thing or two about digital social learning. But we did it. So that's kind of ouchy to hear. So I think we've got a lot to learn. There's no doubt about that. And there's many areas where we need to change. But I question the popular narrative that all the change is going to come from outside. I've been lucky enough, as, as uh, Sheila introduced me, and as I mentioned on my timeline, to have been involved with uh, a whole range of uh, agencies over my 20 years in EdTech. Um, and just to give a, a bit of background, at Bechter, there was the National Grid for Learning, which brought broad, broadband to schools uh, and then had a number of regional and national initiatives to help schools benefit from that. Alongside that, there were initiatives like Curriculum Online, National Curriculum ICT Expertise, Assistive Technology, Computer Games in Education, all kinds of state-funded initiatives. And in EFI, we had FURL uh, and the Information Learning Technology ILT Champions and the FURL Practitioners Programme and the National Le Learning Network Materials. And I uh, worked alongside them and Bechter's community and adult learning team. And in universities, I helped to develop the Open Access Research Repository Network and worked on the UK Open Educational Resources Programme, particularly with the Joram Repository of Sharing Learning Materials. And it wasn't just about the agencies that you see on those slides, because we also worked with the HEA subject centres and organisations like NILTA and NIACE. I'm curious how many people in this room and watching online have been involved with these sorts of agencies. So we've got a quick poll for you. got a quick poll. <laughs> Hadn't warned you at the back. <laughs> so I'm um, going to ask you about your experience uh, via Me Too. Is that coming up? Yeah. So some of you will see it already. You see the questions on the Me Too. Interested to know, in the room and, and online, how many have been involved with FURL, ILT Champions, or National Learning Network? Because I recognize lots of faces. How many of you have been involved with projects funded by JISC or other government or EU projects? Just give you another half a minute. We've got results coming in? Great. Brilliant. Now, the first one's really interesting because that's a higher proportion of people who've been involved with those initiatives than are currently FE members of ALT. So it goes to show that we're overlapping and connected communities. That second one's incredible. 80% of people who've responded have been involved in some way by projects funded by JISC. And pretty impressive as well. Look at that other government funded or EU government funded projects, nearly 60%. Thank you. So these were state-funded sector-wide change programs. In the history of EdTech, governments are often referred to as slow to change, as blockers to innovation, as regulators that are too late. But if you look at what we've achieved in the UK, it tells a slightly different story. There's a long tradition of influencing the marketplace, stimulating demand for new types of digital products, setting and nurturing standards and improving supply. There's a lot of collective endeavor. So not strictly EdTech, but look at interlibrary loans, open access repositories, look at the Janet network itself, and open standards, IMS content packaging, experience API, and open source. Look at Xerti, close to home. Look at H5P, Scandinavia, and look at Moodle around the world. There's so many examples of collective endeavor. 
So there's a lot of talk at the moment about disruptive innovation, and we can be quite critical of our ability to change. But the point I want to make is it's not all commercial vendors and market forces imposed on us. We've actually done some really great things together. HE. HE is not unique. And maybe we should stop talking about how unique we are, and we should listen. We should listen to schools, to FE, but we should also listen to healthcare and government. Because so many sectors are having a digital turn. Digital transformation is a thing. We don't own it. It's not just our challenge. Thinking of healthcare, I sometimes imagine a new tool being introduced into a hospital, and I wonder whether consultants and surgeons could say, hmm, it doesn't really fit my practice. I prefer traditional methods. There might be some lessons about practice change that we could learn from healthcare. Okay, this is the best I could find, but I challenged someone to do one of these for institutional learning technologists. I think the things that we discuss as a community of practice are not always the things that we're doing. Or at least they're not always the things that we're spending most of our time on. I was looking at the data from the old members survey, um, and I know it's, it's quite hard to read on the slide, but a wide range of uh, things that people are spending their time doing there. And in the top five, that looks pretty much like my top five as well, actually, content management systems, VLEs, electronic assessment, blended learning, and so on. And in the bottom five are a lot of the things that we talk about at conferences. So that's interesting. And let's have a particular look at learning analytics, which comes there somewhere near the middle of concerns. So alt members have reported for themselves that, that this is an area growing in importance. And the Heads of eLearning Forum has also done a, a survey on how important and what stage of maturity learning analytics are at. So this is one person uh, replying on behalf of their institution with a sort of bird's eye view. And you'll see there 62%, the vast majority, that's a really bad pipe, diagram, isn't it? Working towards implementation, and some partially implemented, and fair number not implemented at all. So we're talking about it a lot, and that's right, and we need to understand what that is, but we mustn't confuse that with representing what we're spending our time doing. I couldn't resist sharing that one. And a serious point there is that we won't get traction just because something is interesting to us. It has to be the right time, and it has to be the point at which this is useful to us and to our institutions. Because learning analytics is still emerging, and that's okay. And meanwhile, we're pretty busy with our VLEs and our uh, e-assessment. I sometimes hear people saying at alt -C, why are we still talking about this? Why are we still talking about this? Like, why are we still talking about how to use a VLE and roll out a VLE? Why are we still talking about active learning in the classroom? Because this isn't it, isn't it? <laughs> this isn't it. So who is we? Because at this conference, there'll be some people here for the first time, some people new to this field. And we come from different fields, we converge together, and participation is always in flux. Second point, I also commend to you Martin Weller's concluding post in his 25-year series. He points out that, uh, for example, intelligent tutoring systems, sometimes you need a few cycles at an idea to get it accepted. So we do need to go round things a few times. But thirdly, and most importantly, what kind of practice-based knowledge can just be solved? That's it, we've worked it out. There we go. Example, so project managers. Lots of us work with project managers. There's professional frameworks for project management. There are courses, qualifications, conferences, communities. It's a practice. People are inducted into the practice. They use the concepts. They continue to learn, develop those concepts. They never stop learning about how to do good project management. 
And where, where I'm based on campus, I work near our Centre for Teacher Training. And obviously, they're just given a single textbook on classroom behaviour management, and they pass a test and they're done. Yeah? They never need to discuss classroom uh, behaviour management again. No? No. It's a topic that they continue to develop their practice in. So we're, we're a learning community. And next time you catch yourself saying, why are we still talking about this? I'd suggest that it might not be a learning opportunity for you, but someone's probably learning. And actually, we still should be. Change takes time. Does all of this mean that we're being slow to respond? It's worth thinking about how long it takes to identify opportunities for a change to a module, for example. That module, in a HE sense, might only run once a year. You might be thinking about it that first year. You try and pilot things the second year. You make the changes the third year. That's three years. That's quite a significant cycle. Does that sound too long? Well, of course it takes a while for innovations to be adopted. I'm going to quote Weller again. He says, change in universities is no game for the impatient. There was a really good series of podcasts uh, by Tim Harford about 50 things that made the modern economy. And one of them is about electrification. And he says that they built the infrastructure for Maine's electricity in Manhattan in about 1881. It was all ready and waiting for the factories. But it took over 30 years to exploit it. I quote, factory owners hesitated for understandable reasons. You couldn't just rip out a steam engine and replace it with an electric motor. You needed to change everything, the architecture and the production process. And because workers had more autonomy and flexibility, you even had to change the way they were recruited, trained, and paid. Of course, they didn't want to scrap their existing capital. But maybe, too, they simply struggled to think through the implication of a world where everything needed to adapt to the new technology. In the end, change happened. It was unavoidable. Does that sound familiar? Is this where we are with blended learning? Are we still talking about blended learning after 30 years? Yes. Yes, we are. 2018 is a challenging year in many ways. I'm wearing my anti-Brexit badge there. <laughs> We've got Trump looming. In many ways, it feels like dangerous times. But it also seems to be a period of intense reflection for our community, the year of critical ed tech. It can be hard to be an institutional learning technologist in 2018, and sometimes I wonder, are we the baddies? So how can we be a force for good? It's not about the technology. Many of the conversations I have start with someone saying, the tool will do this. And I say, no, no, you will do this using the tool. Or someone says, and this tool will make sure that everybody shares all the information. And I say, do they already share the information? They say, no, 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 they don't. But when they've got this tool, they'll share the information. I think, hmm. At the end of the day, Digital is people. It's made of our labor. Digital education, particularly, is made of academic labor. So it's really not just about the technology. But there's no digital education without technology. I'm going to quote Anne-Marie Scott here. Put the quote on the slide on a post that she did around next generation digital learning environments. And she's pointing out all the things that we do have to worry about, actually, to make sure that that technology is working. And as she says, high maintenance costs and risky student experience just isn't something that institutions find easy to stomach. But talking, for this, talking about this makes for a rubbish conference presentation, though, so we rarely do. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but technology knowledge definitely matters. Money matters as well. Money definitely matters. I ran a panel session at last Altsy called uh, Evidence Bases and Business Cases. And I said then, it's fashionable to roll your eyes about management concerns. It makes it sound like it's somebody else's problem. But when you get to a certain level as a learning technologist, you have to develop some understanding of costs. And by that, I don't mean that we should do things because they might be profitable or because they might save money. I mean that 
we work in education systems and, and organisations that have limited budgets and we need to understand what the role of the finance is in those projects. We need to understand what the constraints are. And all of this feels quite alien when you start having to write the options appraisal and the business case. But I think we shouldn't be silenced by it. I think we probably need to learn it and we need to speak it. Right. <laughs> Disciplines matter. I've seen a lot of learning technology conference presentations and I've got a particular bugbear. There are particular kinds of projects uh, that get a lot of airtime in our literature. And it's often small cohorts, master's level, and disproportionately education. And then in the evidence base, we see a lot of noise from those sorts of scenarios and a lot less from others. Now, this is quite unscientific, I have to say. Uh, not scientifically proven. I'd love someone to do a literature review and have a look at that. And I'm particularly intrigued as well. There's some really good work that comes out of chemistry. Why is that? Chemistry as a discipline is really interesting. And it comes up with quite different models and conclusions to those that come from uh, that, the bit on the other side. So discipline definitely matters. It's also important to recognize that different disciplines are facing different challenges. So when you need to teach 30 people, it's easy to criticize people who are trying to work out how to teach 500 people in a lecture theater. And if you're in a discipline where it's about reading one text a week and discussing it at a seminar, sure, optimize around that, but recognize that other people in other subjects have got different challenges. Because if, on the other hand, you need lab skills and you've got the challenge of fitting people into the timetable, you've got different challenges. I think we should be very careful as a community to state our constraints and our disciplinary assumptions. A particular point on that is that a lot of the critical digital pedagogy voices that I've heard over the last couple of years have come from the liberal arts, but they're extrapolating quite widely from the liberal arts. And the challenges in those disciplines are not the same as maths or sociology or, or manufacturing. Discipline does matter. Evidence matters. We can't all be researchers and evaluators, though. And that's where, as someone in an institutional learning technology team, I'm very grateful for the old community. Because my stakeholders can ask me a question about evidence, and I can ask all of you. And communities of practice can be very efficient like this. But it also avoids this scenario I've summarized on the slide there. I think sometimes we should save ourselves the effort of giving people evidence when that's not really what they meant. I'll come back to that. One last point about evidence is that the evidence of benefits, the benefits might not be pedagogical. And that's okay. It might be time saving, affordability, might be data quality, and that's all okay. I think that we can't afford to only care about the pedagogical evidence. I think we will sideline ourselves as a profession if we don't engage in the challenges of scale and sustainability. It's not about perfect. Diana Lorelai described learning design as an analogous to building bridges. But I'd go further and say a lot of learning technology is about building bridges from here to there, using available materials, different terrain, constrained by time, cost, and quality. And some of our bridges will not win prizes. But that's not the point. They're about getting people from here to there. So it's not about perfect. We only bring our best examples to conferences but it's not the only thing that we care about. The important thing is that we're building those bridges and that we're being useful. Another point, don't design services for early adopters. I think we do this quite a lot. We design services based on pilots, and that's the early users. But the early market have different drivers for change and different tolerances for risk. So in early VLEs, People are interested in social and collaborative learning and then mainstream uptake. People are interested in using it for document management. Early lecture capture, everyone's talking about flipped classroom. Mainstream 
uh, uptake of lecture capture, we're concentrating on frictionless recording, administrative benefits as well. Same technology, different benefits. And often, the mainstream prefer less choice and simpler defaults. And our systems may need to become simpler over time. Perhaps that's partly what's happening with next generation digital learning environments. As my colleague Kerry Pinney puts it, there is a silent majority versus the deafening minority. And it can be hard to hear the mainstream voices emerging. Be the one to ask the stupid question. This is definitely something that I've learned. I remember asking at a, I think it was a CETIS special interest group. They were showing the learning activity management system, LAMS. And it's like a design tool for sequencing learning activities in a VLE. And I said, do you mean it's like a lesson planner? And a lot of people look very embarrassed and slightly patronizing. <laughs> and the answer from the presenter was, yeah, it's like a lesson planner. So I think say, say the things, be the one to ask the stupid question. And especially at this conference in this community, you're here, you've earned the right to put your hand up and say, what, what is it for? Why did you do it like that? What does that word mean? Ask the question because someone else was probably thinking it too. Dead birds. Not that kind of dead birds. That kind of dead birds. So this is a metaphor that I came up with a few years ago, and Laurie Phipps has uh, em embellished it. And here's what we're talking about. So cats sometimes bring humans dead birds. They're being their best cat selves and doing what they can do and showing us with their gifts. But we don't want their gifts. Think back to when you handed in that project report you'd worked on so hard and senior management smiled and thanked you. But did they really want it? To quote Laurie, you need to be grounded in what is happening and what is needed, and especially what your peers and senior managers want. Without that, it's another dead bird. Don't create a problem out of a solution or solve something that isn't a problem. Recognize the dead birds. Power. So this is from a future happens hack a few years ago. And one of the things that we discussed there was that some of us are at the table, actually. We're not all powerless. Also, sometimes your voice has more currency outside the institution than inside. And something we can all do is amplify the good work of colleagues across the sector. So when you're invited to the meeting about the thing, lean in. They might expect you to put forward a simple advocacy about the new thing, the new tool. Don't. Don't be simple. Give them something more nuanced. You're invited to the meeting, say the things. If you think that they're heading up the wrong path, name the unicorns, say the things, and recognize your power. We design tools to support workflows, and we're part of those workflows. And in many ways, digital education is made of labor, academic labor, and our labor. Some academics don't like to think that the organization has a say in their workflows, but they do, and we do. And some academics also like to assume that their needs are always aligned with the needs of students, but sometimes they aren't. And lecture capture has been a real battleground for this. Now, some of you will have been at Melissa Hyten's talk yesterday around lecture capture, that time of uh, industrial action. And to quote Melissa, if we work with technology for teaching and learning, then all our technology comes into contention during a strike. And I've certainly learned that the hard way. And Melissa's made the point before that perhaps we're at a bit of a pivot point here, where our power within, institution, within institutions is being recognized, and we need to recognize it. And we need to learn how to navigate these issues. So as institutional learning technologists, I think we need to be ethical, respectful, but most of all, I think we need to be useful. We really need to make sure that we're being useful. And thinking of us as a community, come back to my Venn diagram. Our field is big and wide and deep, and no one person can be experts in all these things. 
but maybe this is the job and perhaps these edges are where we're learning and perhaps most importantly these edges are where we are useful and that's okay And as I've put this talk together, I've reflected that perhaps the idea that learning technologies is a single field is an illusion. Perhaps it's not. Perhaps it never was a single field, never will be. Perhaps we're not a single field, but an intersect of many, many specialisms bound by a common purpose. But whatever we are, I do think that we are really important to the future of education. And I'll leave you with this. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think your uh, applause said it all, but what a fantastic keynote. Thank you so Thank much, you. Amber. I'm sure there are some questions. I think we've got some questions coming up from the, the app. But um, also, is there anyone in the room? Is there anyone that would like to ask a question? Yeah, we've got a question there. We'll take that first, and then we'll maybe go to some. Do you want to have a quick chat? Thank, Thank, Thank you so, so much, Amber. Amber. I would just ask um, if you were to design a um, undergrad degree for learning technology practitioners, which we don't, I guess we don't really have them. What would you include? How much philosophy? How much uh, computers? How much chemistry? How much theology? What would you wow. include? <laughs> well, thanks, Louise. That is a, a very terrifying question. <laughs> well, what, that would be an amazing shared project, would be to just design the curriculum even if we didn't actually build the course, to collectively design the curriculum would be fascinating. And I suspect that the actual computing bit would probably be about 20, 30%, and a lot of it would be about how decisions are made, how people teach, and that kind of issue. But that's, that's a brilliant idea. Oh, there's a project for us all. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions from the, the room just now? Okay, I think we've got a few online, yeah. so I'm going to let Amber choose the question she wants to answer, because I think that's only, only fair as well. <laughs> so a couple of, of points have uh, been asked about the uh, imposter syndrome, saying it's very common, what can we do to change this? Um, I, I have, I've read a bit about imposter syndrome, and I've heard that one of the things to do to change this is that anyone who's got it should admit it, so hence why <laughs> I'm admitting it. Um, but also to, to recognise that other people can often see your value in ways that you might not be able to. Okay. So I think it's one of those things about if you're invited to say the things, if you're invited to go to the meeting, you're invited to contribute to the project, that's because people know that you will be useful. Mm, absolutely. Can I just ask at this point, can anyone who has imposter syndrome just stand up? Okay, stand up. <laughs> okay, <so. clears throat> Standing just now. Now you might have noticed that on, on my lanyard, um, underneath my name, it says the boss. I am the boss, and I tell each and every one of you, none of you are imposters. So please, you have to remember that because I've said it now, so it's true. Okay, <laughs> none of us are imposters in this room. Okay. Does anyone else want any questions coming from the the audience? Now that you're not imposters, you can ask, you can ask <laughs> questions. Oh, here, Marion. Thanks, Amber. What an inspiring talk. I've been looking forward to this to a long time. Um, you have so much experience, and you've shared a lot about the different perspectives that you've had in your role. What, what do you think? Um, we've heard a lot about this is more a critical age of ed tech. If you were looking ahead at all, mm -hmm. is there anything you think you'd really like to see happen or you'd like to put out as a call to action to the audience? Sort of something to take Gosh. action on? That's a really good question. I wonder if it's something to do with demystifying things. So there's a lot of experience in the room, in the community, 
about these things that we've circled around again and again, like um, social learning uh, as it manifests itself through our tools, like group work and peer collaboration, now you can support that online. And I wonder if a very useful thing that we could do would be to have a plain English entry level introduction into what it means to do these things well in a way that doesn't alienate people by referring to articles that they must go and read, that is actually at more of the practical level. And there's clearly been some really good work um, on the, the MOOCs and the shared courses. Uh, but even then, I wonder if there's something even more simpler, more distilled underneath that, which means that we don't have to be at the meeting about the thing because someone else can have digested that and take ownership of it. Um, and uh, it, going back to Tressie's keynote yesterday, I think that example of at first we work in partnership, but then if these approaches become embedded and owned in each of those disciplines and each of those departments, we don't even need to be at the meeting because we will have framed the issues right and allowed people to learn those things themselves. Um, I'm just going to take one of the questions here and just embellish it. With <laughs> As you were, um, were presenting, Amber, and you made some very good points about state funding, and I think many of us in the room have been recipients of that, and it was certainly my career has developed, you know, was hugely influenced by that. That seems to have changed now. So I think just as a reflection with that, and this question here, someone says, as the education sector is becoming more like, like a business, how do, you think we, how do you think we can continue to share our knowledge whilst our business managers are trying to make us compete rather than share and collaborate? And I think the wonderful thing about all those projects that we were all involved in was that collaboration, that sharing, that shared risk as well, learning from failure, which we don't seem to be, we don't want to talk about that, or certain people don't want to talk about it that as much, but maybe we get yeah. I suppose there might be a, a strange paradox there, that the way in which communities can carry on talking is actually to close the door, because then it's reducing the risk of uh, institutional secrets being shared with people outside of that level of trust, outside of those trust communities. But that pushes against our openness ethos, and I'm not sure quite how we navigate that. But in my experience of senior managers uh, at a whole range of institutions is that they're really grateful that the people in their institutions are reaching out to expertise from other institutions. They'd just rather that their own dirty linen wasn't aired in the process. <laughs> So there's something about Chatham House rules, I think, and I know that's a challenge when we're trying to be as open as we can. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I suppose just another question that's coming there, and I think you, you, you've touched on it. And you've, oh, sorry, sorry. Question. I'm just saying there's another question coming through there. Um, so how can we be both grounded in what institutions need, solving the problems for today, and, ex and at the same time explore, explore new ideas and new technologies? That's the perennial challenge for us all. Yeah. I suppose part of that is being brave enough that if we, if we think, hey, this would be a really good thing to do, and we think this will take us in a good direction, and I haven't learned this lesson yet myself, but it's being brave enough to really go and check with your stakeholders whether they agree, and to accept that if there's a number of people kind of shrugging their shoulders and say, yeah, yeah, you could, you could do that, that maybe it's not going to get traction, however hard you work. I think it's, it's a continuous process, isn't it? I yeah. Think it's something to do. Okay, now I'm going to, um, this is quite a tricky one, Amber, but hey, we're just going to put you on the spot. So someone says, the learning technologist profession isn't known by the wider community. The amount of times I've had to explain what I've had to do, yeah, I think we've probably all been there. A firefighter never has to explain their job. Could you succinctly <laughs> describe what learning technologists? I think that might be a general challenge to us all. Answers in 140 characters, please. <laughs> But there are a few definitions yeah. coming through. So I, I usually say to the stranger, I usually say uh, I manage a team who help people use technology in their teaching. I think that, that works. Yeah. Um, just going to ask you, any questions from the floor? No? Well, I think you've given us all a huge amount to think about, Amber. It was a fascinating talk. I really loved the way that you framed that and your timeline. I know lots of people are now creating their own timeline, so thank you for that. And again, can I just ask everyone to put their hands together and thank our fantastic keynote. <laughs>
I'm John Wilson, I'm the CEO at Agenta. We're a technology company that focuses on education and learning. We build, manage and operate platforms for education, for video collaboration. Externally, we prefer to work with what we feel as ethical industries. Um, obviously education, teaching, learning, healthcare. We feel that we can really contribute to these industries by creating exciting platforms, um, easy to use platforms, secure platforms that people can utilise. What we feel is one of the most important things for Scotland to boost economic growth uh, is investing in rural areas. By investing in uh, broadband in these local areas we can attract more talent, we can attract more companies and we can drastically improve the delivery of education and learning within these schools within disparate regions within Scotland.